And so I got into doing software. I did software for a few years and then I actually just follow problems, I guess, that exist in an organization. Where can I apply my skills to create the most leverage for the organization? And I kind of follow my nose to go and do that. Hey, my name is Felix Tia. I'm the host of The Culture of Code. Each episode, we bring on a tech industry leader, like a software engineer, engineering manager, or product manager, for them to come on and talk about their career and what has worked, what hasn't worked to get them to where they are today. In today's episode, we have Julian Dunn, Director of Product Management at GitHub for GitHub Actions and previously Director of Product Marketing at PagerDuty. Julian has a diverse background in product and engineering roles. Julian, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Felix. Yeah. So I mentioned earlier that you're the Director of Product Management for GitHub Actions. Tell us more about what is GitHub Actions. If you're a developer, is a CI/CD product that's integrated right into GitHub. And if you don't know what CI/CD is, it's basically the process of after you develop your code, it's the process of how you actually build that code and get it into a, a production environment and all kind of the stages along that way. So production environment could be anything like if you're building a website, that's like where you're actually delivering it to, so it's actually going to be seen by customers. It could also be like apps, for example, like an app that runs on your desktop computer, or it could also be mobile apps and things like that, and you deliver it to an app store or something like that for ultimate publishing. So it's a product that helps you basically automate all the steps of that, including running your unit tests and integration tests and quality checks and all that kind of stuff, and uh, working with other developers to integrate your code together to eventually deliver it to customers. Awesome. Yeah, we use a bunch of it here at Stripe, so a big, big fan of it. So I mentioned that you are the director of product management for GitHub Actions. Can you tell us more about the product management org at GitHub? Like how many different product lines are there? How many directors are there? Like what's the, the makeup of the team? Yeah, for sure. I would say that there's a lot of different products under GitHub's portfolio now. GitHub has been around for over a decade. And not only do we obviously have the core product that as developer you're probably familiar with, the source code management and the issue tracking and things like that. Of course, those folks have product managers of their own, but you've got sort of newer products like the one that I work on. GitHub Actions has been in the market for maybe four years at this point. And then you've also got security products, which is a whole other different domain where you're doing code scanning and dependency management and things like that, a whole other ball wax. And then you've also sort of got the open source side of the house with different products that are more for open source program offices. If you know what that is inside a company, especially a larger company, you have teams that are working on trying to share code inside a company, inside Stripe, for example, right? Somebody's written a library. We want to evangelize that inside an organization. The open source program office helps to facilitate some of those interactions and that what we call intersourcing. So all of the product management organization at GitHub is probably somewhere between 50 to 80 or maybe more folks I haven't counted recently because again, it's very domain specific. So I don't necessarily work day to day with a lot of other product managers in different parts of the organization. But what I do obviously work closely with uh, engineering and, and design. And so we try to run these different domains as uh, independent business units for that reason, because uh, you know, there's not a lot of, sometimes there's not a lot of crossover between, you know, what somebody who's working on a CICD system cares about versus security. Yeah, we've spoken to a couple of people that work in product management on this show, and GitHub specifically is in a unique position where about four or five years ago, Microsoft acquired GitHub. Tell us more about how when a large company like Microsoft acquires a company, is it well integrated with the Microsoft? Like, is it pretty separate? What's the interaction between GitHub and a large tech company? Yeah. What I'll also say is I'll just copy out this with, I wasn't working at GitHub at the time the acquisition happened. That was in 2018, 2019, somewhere in that time frame. What I would say is that Microsoft has been very judicious in terms of uh, where there are integration points with GitHub and where to kind of leave it alone. And what I mean is, for example, what they could have done is brought it in and run it as totally a Microsoft kind of brand, but they don't. They keep it separate for a reason. And I really admire Satya Nadella, the CEO, for being quite savvy in this realm and really recognizing what's Microsoft strong at and what they're not strong at. And what they're not necessarily strong at is the type of developer that GitHub sells to. And so what they didn't want to kind of do, I think, is come in and let's just roll it over and apply kind of the Microsoft brand or the Azure brand, because it doesn't really make sense. Developers don't find affinity with things like Microsoft or Azure because who buys those kinds of products in Microsoft or Azure? Typically the CIO, it's typically somebody that's like working on supporting PCs and financial systems and back office, right? It's not necessarily the folks that are working in developing software for delivering customer value. It's not necessarily your VP of engineering or your CTO. So 
when they acquired the company, I thought they did something really, really smart, which is to keep those brands separate. And so we use all um, our own tools. We don't use Microsoft tools. We use Slack, for example. We don't use Teams. We don't use the Google suite. We don't use the Microsoft suite. And who knows, at some point that might change. But there's a reason to kind of try to preserve that culture and the nature and you know, GitHub as a separate subsidiary for that reason, because we understand developers really well. And the company didn't want to wreck that by bringing that, bring that under, you know, fully under the Microsoft. Yeah, I never thought about that, but that makes a lot of sense. I hear a lot of your product marketing background experience coming through when you explain that. And I want to talk about that. Your career has spanned from hardware engineering to software engineering, DevOps, product marketing, and now product management. What led you to make these kind of career shifts along the way? How did you know that it was the right time to make the shift? And how did you know which direction you wanted to head in at these different times? Yeah, I guess it depends on your personality. Like I'm the kind of person that I'm much more of a generalist and I get bored pretty quickly once I get to knowing about 70 or 80% of a field or a domain or a job. And again, if you're a developer listening to this, doesn't necessarily mean you have to follow my path. Obviously I don't give advice. I just give my stories. There are lots of developers that spend an entire career in a particular domain, becoming an expert and moving up to senior, to staff, to principal, and eventually to distinguished engineer within a particular domain. That's a perfectly fine career path to follow. And we really definitely value those folks that we have staff principal and distinguished engineers. But my journey has been, you know, I feel like, as you mentioned, I started out actually doing hardware engineering back in the day, a long time ago, over 25 years ago. And I just wanted things to move a little bit more quickly. Hardware is, I mean, I think it's a lot different these days, but nevertheless, when you're fabricating something that's physical, the amount of time, when we talk about agile today and software development, you really don't have a lot of that in hardware because ultimately you need to fabricate something. And then the feedback loop of getting that part back and testing it and validating it. And then that design cycle, that loop is like pretty slow. And of course, nowadays simulators are more modern, but nevertheless, you're still fabricating something. And to get that product out to market, I mean, think about how long it takes Intel to get a chip out to market. I mean, that's going to be upward of four or five years if they're starting from a new, completely new product line. And I just wanted things to move faster. So that's how I quickly moved into doing software. Once I got into doing software, I did software for a few years, and then I actually just follow problems, I guess, that exist in an organization. Where can I apply my skills to create the most leverage for the organization? And I kind of follow my nose to go and do that. So in my, I was working for a company and doing software development, but actually the operations side, web ops, or what I guess today we would call DevOps, was just not very mature. The company was growing, the online presence was growing very, very quickly. This was the age of, I was working in broadcast and this was the age of what we called new media at the time, putting all this content online and, and the operations were just falling down, right? The site was crashing all the time. We weren't able to sustain the traffic. So I volunteered to go over there and to help them out. And that's how eventually I started a long career in doing that kind of stuff and DevOps and what have you. And then I guess my pivot into product management again was Following this, you know, what did the company need? Really, I was working as a consulting engineer at, at the time, kind of a solutions engineer for a DevOps tools company. It's called Chef. Maybe some of you have heard of it. The product still exists, and I don't know the company's that hot or popular anymore, but the company really needed help doing product management. They didn't have a formal product management department, and it really showed in terms of the types of things that we were able to bring to market and not, and responsiveness to customer needs. So a colleague of mine and I went and started the product management department. We brought along a third person and uh, introduced product management to that organization. That was my first product management job. I knew I wanted to do product management for a long time. It was really hard to get into it if you'd never done product management before. So I figured the easiest way to do it is just to make a lateral move at the same company that I was at and then uh, have that on my resume and then I kind of go from yeah, I definitely want to talk a bit about this starting basically a product management department from scratch in a second. Super interesting. One thing you mentioned earlier, though, was that the catalyst behind why you decided to start looking elsewhere was because you felt yourself as a generalist and you got bored easily. And I think your solution to it was to shift careers, shift function, shift the kind of work that you were doing. Do you find that this is possible to do within or maybe do you have a recommendation for how someone that wants to stay within a certain function, let's say that they're on a software engineering track, but they do feel like they're a generalist and they do get bored easily. Is it possible to still have a thriving career within that one I guess, silo? Or do you find that there's kind of limits to that? If you see yourself as a generalist and you see yourself getting bored. There are. What I would say is that you have to also calibrate it to like one thing, one piece of advice that you know, somebody gave me at one point that I kind of wish I'd listened to a little bit sooner was when you go and look for a company, 
thinking about the size of the company and the orientation of the company, not, not just the growth of that company, but also just like, what's your sweet spot and what do you like? And then kind of match that to like what you want to do in your career. So if you want to continue being an individual contributor, but you know that you get bored in an area within a year, year and a half kind of thing, or you're like, I really know everything that there is to know about React and I keep doing that, but I want to learn some other languages and I want to work on more backend stuff or systems programming or whatever it is. You got two choices. Like one is to work for a company that has a lot of those domains. And that kind of means it's got to be big enough to do that, right? Like GitHub at about somewhere between three and 4,000 people at this point is we have all those functions and there is some internal mobility that's available to go and do that. The other thing I would say is that the other way you can actually go about doing that, become a generalist and to move around, as long as you don't mind a little bit of the chaos is to go work at a startup because in a startup as an engineer or an engineer on a small team, you're going to naturally wear a lot of hats. You're going to own a lot of the tech stack. Now, there's some, if you want to switch domains or you want to switch areas on a slower cadence, that's probably not the best best move. But working in a startup allows you to both work in front end, back end, data systems, whatever, data analytics and all this kind of stuff, kind of at the same time. But if you don't like all that frequent contract switching and things like that and having to page in all these different areas, then sometimes maybe a startup isn't necessarily the best for you. So the advice is kind of got to know yourself and then match that to the size and type of company and maturity of the company that you're going to work at. Yeah, I love that. I never thought about the importance of the size of the company being in play here. And I think that that's an important thing you point out. And when you're kind of recounting your career path, you made it sound like the opportunity just kind of fell in your lap and you just got them easily. So I'm sure that you sought them out and there's more of an effort behind it than you explained. Can you give us some advice or maybe your experience with seeking out opportunities and then also how to vouch for yourself in a way where you get chosen or you get the opportunity to actually take on whatever you're looking for? Yeah, for sure. I mean, first is to be knowledgeable in the domain or the area or the job that you want sufficiently. I mean, auto management is hard because you can know about it academically, but until you kind of lay hands on doing it, all the books that are out there to read are like, they're helpful to get a grounding of what it means to be a product manager. But a lot of experience in product management just can't be gained from, from literature. So it's, First, knowing what you want to do and then trying to naturally t find opportunities for yourself to exercise those kinds of things. Now, maybe if you're a software engineer and you're looking to move into, like, let's say you're a front-end engineer and you're looking to move into back-end, that's a little bit easier because people can naturally kind of, there are always tasks and things like that that gravitate towards back-end. You can take those in easy, more easily. If you're looking to maybe switch discipline, so for example, if you're an engineer trying to get to product management or you're an engineer trying to get to design, it's a little bit more challenging because that stuff doesn't naturally come up. It's not really adjacent to your day-to-day -day work. But what I would say is if you have that interest is to try to figure out how you can take on some of those tasks and ask your product or your design counterparts for things that you can help with and be transparent with them that you're thinking about what it would be like to be a product manager, what it would be like to be a designer or even marketing or whatever it is, right? And then eventually, if you kind of do that, not only that it serves two purposes, one is it gets you some hands-on facility with actually doing it. And second of all, it gives you a sense before you jump right in and actually take a job with a title of product manager or whatever, whether you actually like doing that, right? Because I think what's important as a professional is like, not only do you have to be good at something, but you also have to enjoy that thing. Because look, I'm good at a lot of things, including, and I feel like I don't know if you touched on this or not, but I actually did a detour out of tech when I went to journalism school and tried to be a reporter at one point. I was actually a very good reporter but I actually hated the work. I actually hated this whole process of trying to find guests and to people that don't want to talk to you and interview them and all that kind of stuff. And I just wanted to write the stories. So I was good at the job, but I didn't really want to do it. So that's kind of why you want to figure out a way to do the job that you're targeting in some lightweight way before you actually jump right in and take that job and, and apply for that. Yeah, I think that this also requires like a pretty a large degree of self-awareness too, where I think people can get handcuffed to things that they're good at, but they don't enjoy, but then they think that because they're good at it, they should stay with it. Did you find that that was easy for you to recognize that while I'm good at journalism, for example, I actually don't want, I'm actually don't enjoy. And was that easy for you to switch off of it? Or did you have to kind of build that confidence and be able to, to leave something that you're good at? I think, well, that specifically, I didn't really like right off the bat, the whole pounding the pavement and trying subjects to talk to, to go and write a story and being on deadline every day to do that. So I didn't really enjoy that part of it. Some other things are slower burn. Like there's a reason that 
I made the switch. I made a switch from product management into product marketing and then back again. And that took sort of like three or four years for me to really understand the state of product marketing and to recognize that I didn't really want to continue having a marketing kind of career. There's definitely elements of product marketing that I still do enjoy doing and am very good at in the broad. But once you start getting into, and this is naturally me, there's lots of folks who are technical that do like these things. But in product marketing, there's a lot of things where you're having to interface with like campaigns or demand generation or like social media or PR or analyst relations. And those types of interfaces and working with those folks and eventually kind of owning those functions if you're to become a CMO and brand also. I have opinions about them and I want them to be done well and I kind of know what good looks like. But to kind of own those functions and have to interface with them, that's just not really my passion. Like I'm not passionate about establishing a brand and maintaining a brand and sort of corporate messaging and things like that. So it took me enough time working in product marketing to understand the adjacencies in marketing for me to be like, no, oh, that's not really a thing that I want to like extend my, my career into because the more senior you become, and especially in management, the more functions you eventually accumulate that don't have a lot to kind of do with where your heart soul is sometimes, you got to be okay with that at some point, right? So for example, nowadays as a product leader, I spend a lot of time on financial analysis and profit and loss, and looking at our gross margins and stuff like that. And although I could never see myself as a CFO, I don't reject doing that stuff. I'm not like, oh, I don't like looking at our income statement. I actually enjoy it on some level. Yeah, and I think you mentioned to us that one of the most common questions you get asked is like why this back and forth switches from product management to product marketing and back to product management. And you said that you recognize that also that product marketing is not seen as like a power center compared relatively to product management and that this seems to be getting worse over time. Can you tell us more about like this observation that you made and what it meant? Yeah, I think it's actually a huge problem in the industry, Felix. It's totally inverted from when I started my career in tech, by the way. Even like if you think about the 90s, product marketing kind of ruled the roost. Product marketing was, let's take Microsoft, for example, how like Windows 95 or Windows 3.1 came to bear, or some of the other things like Microsoft and Carter, whatever the innovations in Microsoft in the early 90s were very product marketing led. That's understanding the market and what the market needs. Think about Windows 3.1. It's like, what did the market need? The market needed something, an operating system for these IBM PC computers that were cheaper than Macs, but were easier to use. So it was a huge gap. People couldn't afford Macs, but they found PCs hard to use. The product marketing came to it from a market perspective, like what does the market need? What's the problem to be solved? And then go and build those solutions and enter the market to go and kind of solve those things. And I think back then, product management was not as mature of a discipline. I think it was much more confused with like project management and things like that, or program management. And even Microsoft used to use that title for a product manager, so the program managers. And I think over time that has more shifted to be, to be more product oriented. So I think as part of that dynamic and part of these shifts and also the shift to kind of agile product management has kind of over the last 15 years or so has grown up to be more of that, more of that power center and kind of controls the roadmap and controls where the investments are. And unfortunately that means that product marketing kind of takes a backseat and isn't really seen as unfortunately um, strategic to many organizations. And often it's just seen as, oh, we build something and throw it over the wall in a product marketing and it's product marketing stuff or like launch something or whatever, right? As opposed to how I think about product marketing, which is if they're your strategic partner and making sure that also product management isn't only thinking about just building things, because building things is really expensive, right? We all know how much software engineers cost. And a team of 100 engineers, that's really expensive. And there's many ways to kind of address a problem, and if you're problem-oriented, without having to write code. And that could be partnerships, that could be changing your brand, that could be any other elements of go-to-market, that could be orchestrating how your sales team is going and selling the product. So those are the kinds of things that product marketing brings to the table, that wider lens about what you, what you actually need to do. So I definitely value my time in, in product marketing. And I would say for any product managers kind of listening to the call, it's like you should figure out a way to at least get some facility, facility in what strategic product marketing looks like and why positioning and messaging is actually so important for you to understand in your product before you go and build anything and how to start with frameworks like, for example, Amazon's working backwards framework, how to start with the customer, how to start with the problem. Because especially 
I see a lot of sometimes engineers coming up through the ranks and moving into product manager and they're focusing solely on like features and functions and that turns into like this kind of like better mousetrap thing, right? Oh, we invented this thing. By the way, I think AI is full of this now. Fortunately, right now, there is some utility to AI, but there's so much of the AI is like, I have this cool algorithm, this cool LLM. What am I going to go and apply it to? It's now a solution in search of a problem. And so the product marketing skills and that discipline helps you to make sure and ground yourself to make sure you're not just running around writing code because it's cool or because there's some newfangled thing like AI or these LLMs and chat GPT, whatever that you could make use of. What's the actual customer problem and pain point that they're solving? And then you get to how can I maybe apply some of this technology like AI to solve some of those problems or not? Yeah, that's great, great, great explanation. And speaking of engineers that switch over, you mentioned earlier about how you fell into product management because you're working as chef and that there was no product management discipline or team and you and a colleague started this department. I think... For listeners out there that might be at maybe at smaller startups that the founder is the product manager or maybe the the most senior engineer is the product manager holding some kind of a function there and they want to help establish something larger. Tell us more about your experience and like how you even you look you and your colleague look each other in the eye, like let's start this thing. That situation was actually really tough. I certainly wouldn't recommend it. I think nowadays in twenty twenty three, startups have a better sense that they should probably introduce product management early, not at the very beginning. And I see a lot of founders, and you're right, Felix, many times your founder is, whether or not they think of themselves or not, is product manager number one. I mean, it is, right? They have to be just by nature of the products that they're making. Now, at a startup level, it actually turns out when you're starting or introducing that function, and by the way, the introduction of that function could be that founder is like, I need help, or that's not the thing I'm good at, again, back to like what you're good at versus what you like doing. That founder may decide, I I know how to do it. I obviously have some facility in doing it because I got my startup going, but that's not where I want to spend my time. I like to spend more time with customers or whatever. And how do they bootstrap that function? Not only is it not about not leaving it too late, but it actually turns out to not be about, at a startup level, about the, the mechanics of starting product management, but it's about people, actually. And I think some of the challenges in a startup in, in introducing product management function is that Product manager number one, who's the founder or CEO, often doesn't want to let go of certain things and doesn't want to themselves set those bounding boxes and give the autonomy to a product management function to go and run, right? So it's a very much like if you're a startup and you're thinking about doing this, it's a negotiation on both sides. The person that wants to do product management is like, here's the definition of where my roles and responsibilities are going to be, but then it's also about convincing the founder or CEO to kind of let them run with that. And what outcomes is that CEO going to hold that product team accountable to without having to jump in and micromanage them? So it turns out at a startup level, it's like less about introducing the, the function and mechanics than about getting the bounding boxes, if you will, around people's responsibilities. Because otherwise it's just the CEO is just going to come and be shadow product manager or shadow VP of product. And I've seen so many situations. That's a VP is the product from startups call me all the time and say stuff like, you know, I just couldn't get it over the line with my CEO that I was going to be in charge of the product. Yeah, I feel like with product management, it almost seems like the function within a company that almost always has the, like the blurriest or like the most dotted lines from who your stakeholders are and like who you report into, who reports into you is like very blurry, at least from the outside look, looking in. Maybe when you're first getting started, it's hard to know where the boundaries are. What's your advice for like new product managers that are trying to figure out like what's the landscape that they're operating in. Yeah, I would say this this is actually where the literature comes in handy and to read some of the leading books around like what does it mean to be to do modern empowered product management. You use the word power because there's literally a book called Empowered from the Silicon Valley product group that I find extremely helpful. If there's inspired and then there's empowered and there's one about product marketing. But those two are the ones that I would kind of focus on inspired and empowered written by a guy named Marty Kagan, who's legend in product management circles. And it just should give you an orientation about what the most forward thinking and mature organizations, they're often software organizations, but not always, how they think about product management. And then what you want to do is to take those beliefs or those practices and line them up against how your company thinks about product management. And if you start being like, oh, there's too much deviation from sort of what's the accepted industry best practice. Well, you kind of got a choice to make. 
it's like one thing you could do is you could say, that's okay. I still want to do that role. And what the company expects of me as a product manager, even though it's different than sort of what the best practice is, I don't mind because at least I get a title or whatever, and I can get some experience in that. But you got to be sometimes maybe we'll get frustrated that it's like not mapping to what the industry thinks of. And and maybe you're going to have a hard time changing it. The other reason to do it, and if you're kind of like a masochist like me on some level, is like, look, there's that gap. But you're a change agent, and I guess fundamentally that's also what I do, right? The, the generalist thing is I kind of said, I follow my nose about where problems are, and then I try to change the organization, I try to change those functions or how the organization perceives those functions. Is if you want to try to make that better and change product marketing and the nature of product or product management in an organization, then you can take that job and try to be that change maker. And that's ultimately what I was doing at Chef. I wouldn't recommend trying to introduce product management to a startup that's seven years old because it's like really hard and people have ingrained beliefs around who controls what and who controls the roadmap and things like that and how you do things. But I think eventually we did get it to a good place. It was a couple of years of like just really painful work, but it was very fulfilling. It's probably one of the most fulfilling experiences I had doing product management. Yeah, I like that you talk about how you follow your nose to find where the problems are. And I think one of the scary things about that is that there's probably no playbook to solve those problems because if there was and it was easy, it probably would have been solved already or it would have been easy to solve. How do you make sure that you have maybe the support or the backing that I'm going to try this thing to try to solve this thing or try to help contribute to the solution and you don't know if it's going to work or not and maybe it doesn't work? Like, how do you make sure that that doesn't hurt your career? Yeah. I think even if you're unsuccessful at certain things, I certainly launched products at Chef that were unsuccessful for a number of different reasons. It's about how you tell the story around that. So you want to balance what was controllable by you, but also what maybe the dependencies, the external dependencies that were outside of your control, the constants to not be successful. As long as you can tell a story around that. I mean, no interview is like expecting like a string of hits. Every musician has a one or two records that didn't work. So what I would say is, how do you frame that up and what's the story that you can tell about those failures? The other thing I would say is, and this is more to the way you're in the trenches and you're actually doing that work and how do you try to get as much success as possible, which I think is kind of the first part of your question, Felix, is like, I never take those kinds of opportunities without knowing that there's at least some allies or some prospective allies or some way to grow allies. And those allies, I certainly wouldn't take those roles if I didn't have my immediate boss being supportive, right? Maybe the next level up or maybe the C-suite doesn't get it or whatever. But, you know, as long as I have support from my boss and it's not about like day-to-day support, it's just like, do we do we align on our point of view about how this should work, roles and responsibilities and things like that. And the other thing that it helps to have is like peer support too, right? Just folks on your team, you don't have to win them all over, but like peers, peer product managers or peer engineering managers, whatever it is, if you're talking about like engineering kind of organized engineers or whatever it is, or engineering management, it helps to have peers that you can kind of talk to about some of these issues, right? Because they have to happen oftentimes behind closed doors. They're touching on very complex systems. They involve people and you have to have a safe space for those kinds of things. So I guess I would also then maybe add a third thing, which is I don't do these things in environments that don't have high psychological safety because it's impossible, right? And so if you're in an organization and you're like, these rules are not what they should be, but the company has very low psychological safety and it's just very combative, that's not likely to be an organization where there's going to be a lot of change to be made or even personal growth in your career, right? So you're going to have to just think carefully. And again, really in my career, I worked for organizations that had very low psychological safety and no wonder I couldn't change anything. No wonder it was very much like I felt like I was getting thrown into the bus a lot and made me very frustrated and angry. And I should have probably left those organizations a lot sooner and I kind of realized that it was a system problem. Yeah, I, th- I think that the tough thing always is that you, when there is low psychological safety, it's hard to know if you're the only one feeling that or that if it's you or, or if it's them. It's kind of hard to, a lot of times, not to blame yourself for, for the lack of maybe progress that you're making. But I think you're right that organizations that have low psychological safety will kind of just play to not lose rather than like play to win and just try to keep things without rocking the boat. And you mentioned that you had a, a time in your career where you stayed too long in a company that was dysfunctional. Tell us more about what maybe finally pushed you over the edge. Or like, how would you recommend others people recognize that it's not them, it's the company that is the issue and it's time for them to leave? I think I 
As a product manager, one of the things that is important in this role is to like gather a lot of data and observe what's going on and observe what's going on in systems that are kind of like outside of your day to day too, right? How is sales doing? How is marketing doing? How is leadership doing? And to answer your question, Felix, I would say paying attention to just who gets promoted in an organization. What are the incentives? On what basis are they getting promoted? Do you agree with those decisions or not? How is the company leadership messaging what they're doing and initiative that they're doing and how tone deaf or not do you feel that they are relative to like where you are in an organization and what your role is. And I think things are a lot different now too, but maybe 15, 20 years ago when I started making some of these moves towards more of the business side, organizations where technology is not the core business are naturally going to treat the people that work in technology different, right? Because like, let's take an airline, for example, if you're working for an airline as a developer or in the tech space, whatever designer, product manager, whatever, and they don't kind of see you as an airline person, like you're not a pilot or a baggage handler or whatever, there's always going to be a little bit of that deck that's stacked against you. And it's not to say that you can't kind of overcome that, right? But their empathy for you, like empathy flows both ways, right? And in engineering and product, we say, oh, understand your customer and understand your stakeholder, understand if you're working for an airline, understand what the pilot's day-to-day -day is or the baggage handlers or the ramp agents or whatever it is. <clears throat> Paying attention to is the empathy flowing in the other direction from your company leadership towards you, where they're looking to see what technology can kind of add as a differentiator and accelerant to their business, even though they're not a technology business, if you see those signs that it feels like they're kind of treating the technology department that way, and that is kind of good, right? That they're starting to kind of think about technology a little bit differently. And that leadership team has propensity or the ability to kind of change. But sometimes in those organizations, they don't think about it that way. They still think of technology as the back office. I see this often in financial institutions, banks and things like that, right? Where it's like, the front office is the traders and the people that are making all the money and are selling stocks and bonds or whatever it is. And the back office literally has like worse office space, right? Worse laptop refresh schedule. You can never get the development tools that you want and things like that. And you can tolerate that for a little bit, but after a while, if you're like, there's they're not really changing because their mindset is so like front office, back office, and that's always been the way that it is. And it's always going to be that way. You got to ask yourself that question. Is that the organization that you want to work in to grow your career? Maybe yes, maybe not. Right. And again, it depends on a lot of other factors, including where you are in life and what other obligations you have and your family and things like that. But, and if you're happy doing the work that you're doing and maintaining those systems and things like that, then maybe there's not a problem, but you, know, you start getting, seeing yourself getting frustrated at some of those things. That's when you start paying attention to the inputs that are kind of outside of your engineering domain or your department. Be like this doesn't really make sense like how is this function being treated and how does the company think about technology as a function yeah i think the sean example that you have about your career the rather the biggest advice that i see from just the way that you conducted your career is that your environment is really important to your success and your happiness and that you should feel empowered or feel you have the right to to judge the environment like critically and decide whether it's good or not for you and if it's not that you should you you should feel that that's enough reason to, to leave. I mean, you, you mentioned other obligations, but, you know, I think you should feel that the right that if it's not a right fit, it's not always you. It's just sometimes the environment around you. Mm -hmm. So speaking about the way that things were done, the, the time that you've been product manager and how things have changed, what do you see as the future of product manager? What do you think that you are seeing that looks promising, that looks exciting to you about how things are shifting in the world of product management? I think it gets back to kind of what I was saying a little bit about uh, when we were talking about product marketing is... I start to see the next major shift to product management being that you're not just running the delivery engine. You're not just meeting with customers, deciding what to build, but you're now evolving to become a business owner. In the past, there's sort of been this weird bifurcation of product managers. There's sort of two types of product managers. Like the product managers came bottom up, if you will, from <clears throat> engineering and eventually moved into the business or the MBA types that are just looking at product management and sort of from the, the office of the CFO, if you will, that's just numbers and things like that and don't have a lot of like facility with the technology and things like that. 
what I'm starting to see more and more of is like, the reason that I think that there were those two groups is because I think for a long time, people who were technical, technical product managers, if you will, or whatever it is, often like pushed back and resisted learning more about the business and about finances and about just like incentives and of the broader system and things like that. And I'm really starting to see that change because it's like, otherwise if product management as a discipline doesn't kind of change in that direction, then naturally its effectiveness is going to ultimately be limited just at like, well, we're delivering great things to customers, but it's not making us any money. So it's not really an ultimate success for the business. It's a success for the customer, but it's not a great business outcome or whatever, especially in this time of the macroeconomic headwinds that we're facing and things like that. There's a lot more scrutiny and the ability for a product manager to kind of look at that stuff and be able to talk strategic finance and plan out the P&L of their organization. I think that that's a key skill. It's not covered in a lot of product management books today, I don't think, but I personally would like to see more product managers know that kind of thing. What you'll start to see, I think, it's also, again, I'm paying, speaking of paying attention to things in the industry, is like there's, you see CEOs more and more coming from a product background. And it's not just isolated to big tech. Microsoft has always had that culture where like the CEO or the CDPs, the corporate vice presidents and things like that typically come up from a product or technical side. How in the industry though, that has been very, very rare. But you're starting to see more and more of that. It's very incremental, but you're starting to see that. Like Twilio, for example, the CEO of Twilio was the founding and he's technical and he's an engineer and, and VCs or boards or investors start to see, oh, the product manager that then can also kind of have the business side and know how to operate the business and pull other levers other than building software. That actually makes a really good leader because you've already kind of got the soft skills to do that. And it's just a knowledge gap sometimes maybe about how to run a sales function or marketing function finance function. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense that the scope seems to be increasing or at least changing over time to be more effective at these companies. I'm sure that a lot of aspiring product managers come to you and, and ask you or talk to you about what do you find is probably the most either common or most dangerous misconception that people have about product management? I think the most dangerous misconception is that it's just about the execution. Um, and I think that maybe stems from its roots that from more project management oriented stuff you know, product management to me, and I explain this to all my team and, and have for a long time is product management is fundamentally a strategic function. Now you have to be execution oriented too, right? You can't just be a strategist and issue a bunch of strategic memos and come in like McKinsey and here's like a bunch of stuff and it's at a 40,000 foot altitude and then run away and then be like QED. The rest of it is your problem. Like you all obviously can't be like that as a product manager, but once you've got the execution chops down, then it's about the number one thing that I get asked from my engineering team all the time is like, where's the vision? Like, where are we going? What's 12 to 18 months? What's the markets that we're in? What markets are we trying to enter? What would motivate us entering those markets and things like that? So people want the long-term vision and the strategy. And if as a product manager, you're not kind of prepared to think at that level or to do that or to gain that skill. It's a skill that can be taught too, right? But if you're more interested in like, getting into the nuts and bolts and working with engineering and it's like what widget goes here and like this button and the frameworks and the technology and things like that. Like there are product managers that are like that. I'm not saying that we don't have folks like that, but it's naturally limiting kind of to your career. And it's kind of more like you're almost like pinch hitting as an engineering manager at some point, right? So you want to think carefully through those things, right? If that kind of the execution stuff was more your interest, hey, it's it's okay. You know, but there are other roles, but I wouldn't consider a career in product manager management unless you're committed to being on that path. Awesome. Thank you so much, Julian, Senior Director of Product Management at GitHub. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story and your advice and your experience. Yeah, of course. Thanks again for having me, Felix. Like it's been a pleasure. If you want to make sure you don't miss any of our episodes where we talk to leaders in the tech industry, from software engineers to product managers to engineering managers, Make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel and also click the notification bell. And that's all the time we have for this week. I'll catch you guys on the next episode. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you in the next one.